Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. I'm doing pretty good. Our dev site does not ap- appear to be doing the same. I- I'm going to ask, how are you doing over there? I will be better once I fix it after the show, but that's not relevant. I can work off the markdown file, uh, which is eminently readable thanks to its beautiful spec. Um, but besides <laughs> that, we will... Uh, if you if you bear with me, I'll, I'll get it up and ready uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, we have no... Oddly enough, no intro items this week. We do have a lot of developments and we do have uh, quite a few community updates uh, that I found somewhat entertaining this week. Uh, I'll I'll just jump right into them. Uh, The first one, kind of a small one here, uh, Firefly 5.6.5 was released. Really nothing huge uh, going on. It's just quite a few bug bug fixes that were going on uh, and then... He's. It looks like uh, they're continuing to develop on LDAP, which was integrated recently. Uh, so in the 5.6.5 notes, release notes, uh, he just kind of covers that. Uh, there was one issue I found kind of funny, which was uh, issue 5245. Uh, I don't know if you have it right in front of you. It's, quote, fix various weirdly formatted amounts. And if you open up the issue, it shows basically in the budget, uh, someone's trying to create an amount and what's showing up is 300 comma and then about 25 zeros Im- immediately <laughs> after so i don't know who's counting down to that many decimals maybe tracking in bitcoin or some kind of coin who, who knows but uh that one was a fun one um other than that nothing major on that release now we did have some other big project updates with dollar bar uh jumping into their 15 beta which if I'm not going to go through this entire list, there is, I want to say 50 items Mm. that have been updated. Uh, The most notable, uh, I guess, addition or removal is that, you know that your favorite service there, the point of sale, a module that you can add in for point of sale systems. That module, unfortunately, the simple point of sale module has been completely removed. Uh, they now they now have, I guess, a new one, which is called Take POS, Take Point of Sale, uh, which is used. But uh, you can go through and look. There's an entire huge list out there. With these, what I loved with this one was they have this freeze definition. So moving to 15 beta, it looks like... They have, I don't know how what their architecture looks like, but basically they go into these maintenance stages and uh, freeze stages, and they're in a, at a freeze stage right now. So basically the only additions that developers can contribute are essentially bug fixes. And I'm going to pull up the notes here on what it is. When we, I'm going to read it here. When we make a freeze of code, it means we start the beta period. It does not mean that we must not change code. It means that we can do the same thing. It means that we can do something. It means that we can do something and we can't for some other. Poorly worded, but okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure Laurent (laughs) is French. Um, Okay. So that that would would explain that. That makes sense. That makes a little broken English point there. Uh, But it basically goes into what the freeze looks like. And I found this very interesting because... I had not thought about this. Basically, it blocks any kind of architectural change. If you want any kind of architecture change, you're basically not allowed once this thing hits beta. The only changes that are allowed are fixes, style changes, and updates to, I think it was language. Uh, Translate, and when I say language, translation. So they have that freeze definition out there, and then they have a maintenance. Basically, once it gets out of beta, it goes into maintenance, and that's really just bug fixes all around. But awesome to see that Dollar Bar is moving from 14 to a 15 beta here. I'm excited to see that. Uh, and don't know if you have any anything you want to comment on that one or anything to add with that. It's it's very easy to see a large number and, and think, oh, development, you know, must be, must be going really, really well. 
Um, and, and actually, that's the exact tact that Firefox took when they switched their versioning from their like 3.x series and within six months they were at 12 six months later they were at like 36 i was like what, what why hang on why yeah. do you do this um so it's good to see that the numbers mean something to them uh right especially with that freeze definition so you can uh, get a a concept of, of what's going in there um and and they do have it laid out here pretty well so super happy to see that 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 is indication to me of a healthy ecosystem it's a growing pro. It's absolutely. It's a growing project. Uh, I think skipping ahead here to another growing project. I'm going to skip right ahead to Sweet CRM eight, and this is another one. Another update. Sweet CRM eight is quote here, and I love this because when they last posted about eight, it was 2018, and they start off this post with, after many months in the making. Many months. Not wrong. We are ex- not inaccurate. <laughs> we are excited to share with you the most advanced and sophisticated upgrade to date, uh, one that promises to give you even better control of your data and business solutions. And they kind of go into this whole COVID pandemic spout and just kind of it was more a PR post than it was uh, release notes. Yeah, it magnified but the I, need I, for our enhanced CRM capabilities as online marketplaces became saturated. They say with new companies and consumer demands shifted at breakneck speeds. Okay, so that that's great. But if you go back to their post saying new user interface in Suite 8, <laughs> Suite CRM 8, basically this is why it took them 30 months. Uh, <laughs> they did a complete rewrite of their UI. <laughs> They went through and they rewrote everything, I believe, in Angular Mm. uh, with an API first development approach. So after many months, there is there is your reason why it took many months. Um, I I thought that one was kind of fun. I guess they switched to Angular 6. And honestly, we were on 7. I was looking at the pictures of 8 and it does look better. I remember opening up Sweet CRM and I, I didn't hate it. I didn't dislike it, but man, it was it was a little clunky. It felt a little clunky. The UI felt a little clunky to me. So I'm excited to see what eight has to offer. Um and that brings us to our last one here. Our last update. Dan Brown releasing twenty one dot eleven. Uh and with this we have more security releases, uh, some API changes. There are some features. There's an upload limit. But really, most notably, is the two features that were added what were tags. And I, I don't mean to say that it was added. It, it's been there. But it's a better way to list how tags are in Bookstack uh, and a better view for all the tags. Yeah, but a, a then, better way to, to find tags and, and view all the tags that are right. available to you and say, all right, I was, how did I start categorizing these things again and, and being able to kind of get a high level overview of those tags? That, and that's helpful, honestly. I Being able to look at the tags and go, well, that means, I, I break it down back to us, right? It's, all right, these are all tagged with, let's just say upstream project. Basically, we can tag all of those chapters with that tag and basically say, all right, I want to find every upstream project. This is where I can go to immediately find this rather than clicking through each book and finding each exactly upstream project link. Yeah. Uh, so definitely something beneficial. Uh, the next one here was the search system enhan- the search system enhancement, which I, I don't know if you saw this one. Um Basically, it changes the way they're displayed, and it really just looks like it. the word that you search is bolded now. So the functionality is there. The search is there. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, it's just a little UI tweak, it looked like. Uh, and then it also, there was an API edition for search as well that's out there. So awesome to see that that project is still continuing to be worked on. Seems like a great ecosystem as well. Um but those are the major, that's all the community news I had. Uh, there was, there wasn't anything else going on. No, no run deck updates or releases. So 
that is all I have for the community updates. Now, I know we have some of our own developments here, quite a few, actually. I think, uh, do you want to jump into those? I know we have quite a few. Yeah, and and really, this is why I titled the episode Every Dev Has Their Day, because mine was sometime last week where I just started to dive into some of these features. And, uh, and it's ones that I have been throwing around in my head for quite a while, uh, trying to figure out, you know, where do I want to take the project and, and, and really uh, how can we take the next step uh, into something that is functional, something that's resilient, um, something that is featureful. Uh, so I, I, I took uh, a couple major uh, parts of these and 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 kind of did some rearranging uh, and and I think that speaks to you know at least my understanding of the project you look at what sweet CRM did right they were able to take their entire front end and and um, since they had done a good enough job with it previously they were able to to refactor it really is is what it came down to and and uh, there's not a whole lot here that's not refactoring um, that enables other functionality which also got put in there right and and that's that's really the the advantage of any kind of refactoring as as i'm i'm fond of saying there's not there's not tech debt when you're not actively paying it off or it's not actively accruing right um however it is good to plan on that because you're able to say all right it's still well written therefore when i need to refactor it it will be that much easier uh, and and I was actually just surprised how easy it was for for instance the first thing I did was split up the services into roles, and that is really taking advantage of Ansible's new collections feature. Uh, when I first wrote um, the compositional role, it was simply a role. There were there were no collections, right? We we migrated to collections on the 3.0 series, 3.x series, and from then on we have been working basically as a role that happened to be in a collection. Um, this shifts that on its head and says, we are taking advantage and using this collection as a bona fide collection. Uh, we, it's a collection of roles. It has playbooks. You know, we have the possibility of creating our own custom modules and throwing those in there. Uh, so there is, there is a lot that is now available to us with this rewrite. Um, especially that now enables us to start implementing present stopped and absent states of services, which is um, not to spill the beans, but it's it's basically the, the biggest step forward that, that we're going to take probably in the next six months, if not year, uh, because that's going to enable a lot of stuff in the front end, a lot more management via portal uh, of the services right. that are running on your instance. Uh, so I, I know Jack's looking at me like that's going to be a lot of work on my end, but you know, it, it's, it's going to be good. It's, it's good for us to be able to provide this functionality in a sane type of a way. And, and by sane type of a way, I mean the ability to modularize stuff. For instance, all the checking of the Maria DB container, right? If it was instantiated or not, uh, has been farmed out to the MariaDB role. Same with the bind mount points; those have been um, those have been split out into its its own uh, role, which is called by every container which uses bind mount points. Um, and you know, a, a couple different um, updates there. Now, specifically, port portal is obviously going to be a special case. Um, I, I like to try not to treat it as such, if at all possible, because it should just fit into the paradigm. But it really is what allows for all the functionality here. Uh, and as so, there is a part in which it sets up the socket that it runs on. Uh, so that it, 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 it sounds very recursive the way that it needs to call and set itself up um, if it's doing maintenance on itself. So like handling that um, was was something I, I dove into because I was like, you know, I, we want this to be self-hostable, right? We want this to be infrastructure agnostic. You know, it can't be dependent and it has to be independent of our infrastructure. So how do, how do we make that happen? Uh, and a lot of that revolved around commands receivable, which got a lot of love. Um, specifically, moving to uh, branch 
branches of the project. Uh, whereas before we were simply cloning down the master uh, of, of the, the project. So all of the playbooks, um, all of the scripts were all master. Now it's separated into stable major versions. So stable three, stable four, um, as we work on the stable three dot X series and the stable four dot X series. Um, the thought is since a major version would break backwards compatibility, um, anything that is in any of those major versions in the collection should be able to be ran by the same uh, project branch. So, so stable four should be able to run any stable four dot X series. Um, and, and just a lot of scripting around that um, and a lot of cleanup. Uh, I, I noticed that we were leaving Docker containers around as we were building them to run commands receivable. That was taking up space on disk. So we would definitely want to minimize that. They now remove themselves. Um, one of the other th interesting things is that when we're running playbooks, we were running it on localhost comma as the inventory file, which is just the local host. Um, however, that does not pull in the group bars for the rest of the play. So now we are echoing the local host into an actual inventory file and running it from that inventory file. Uh, this now allows us to pick up the group bars directory that is inside of the environment directory. Um, and then a lot of hacks around that environment directory too. Not, not hacks, but a lot of using it inside of portals ecosystem and on the host as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot where that duality is being used, uh, where, where, where the same file is accessible via the host or via the Docker container. Um, a couple of things specific to accounting. Um, so, so to jump in, uh, Jack helped me out with accounting. So, uh, I'm just going back and cleaning up a couple of the, the things here. I'm being a little bit nitpicky, but you know, let me, you know, it's, it's my baby. So okay. I, can, I can do what okay. I want. Um, okay. accounting does have a built-in setup, which we had called previously as an additional task. Um, the problem with that, and, and this kind of all stemmed from me putting volumes in poor in, in accounting and that that broke a lot of a lot of stuff because didn't like that well no it didn't because when you bind mount something onto a container it overwrites that directory inside of the container and then it's up to the entry point to resolve that and a lot of php apps will in the container it will install it into user local source or just user source and then rsync that entire directory over to like var ww html like where where your regular web server would be looking for accounting doesn't do that uh it just sits everything there and pre-populates the modules directory so when i mounted the bind mount point onto the modules directory it overwrote the modules it directory and refused to build because the modules that it needed weren't there the fix uh, I ended up doing because I, I'm not, I, I submitted an issue to upstream. So I'm waiting on upstream to, to work around that, which is the correct way to do it. In the meanwhile, what we're doing is we are spinning up a temporary container, copying those files into the, the bind mounts um, before we build the container. So it's, it's an additional spin up of a container, but that takes, you know, under a second. So I'm not, I'm yeah. not concerned about the, the actual time that takes and it's item potent too. So we should be fine on that front. Um, and then the only other thing I noticed with accounting is it didn't have any help checks. So I wanted to go in and run those and those were failing, which is kind of what led to me finding all the rest of this other stuff. Um, and then talking about specific other, uh, features of the instance, uh, Portal and Command Center. Um, actually, Jack, I'll let you talk about uh, Portal and Command Center here. Sure. Yeah. So, long story short, we were running into timeouts on the deploys for Portal and Command Center, and this was what this would cause minute delays, a couple minutes. Oh, like five delaying. minutes. Yeah, I think yeah, we have. It, it, yeah. I think what Portal, both the Ruby applications were they would wait for a full timeout before starting essentially. So it was three, three or five minutes yeah. where the instance was just waiting on these services to spin up and it would essentially wait for the timeout to happen. And so specifically it was waiting for them to shut down. Cause it would send the, it would send the signal 
to kill the process, but the process had already forked off the command and was no longer there. So until the container got force killed, which was the parent of the parent, uh, it was just sitting there. It would just run. Yeah. Because what? We had we had the full-on init system already in there uh, on the initial deploy like on the initial what what the docker file was configured for what the um how the process was how the container was spun up basically it would run bash and then bash would fork and run the puma the web server so when we wanted to kill one of these applications from the container it would what run a uh, it would try to kill a process. That it, was it would try no to kill the process, there. right? Yeah. So that's where we. That's where the timeout occurred. So we put in a fix. Uh, I don't think it was. Te- now that I think about this, I don't know if we tested it on an instance or maybe we did oh, test it on an it. instance. I for sure tested it. It was yeah. tested, but essentially, what we started to notice with health checks was that nothing was cleaning up processes. Yeah, I would as I health would checks were a, running. I would run a PS on the server and i would see hundreds of these ssl client zombie processes and i saw that and i was like oh that's gonna be a bad day that sounds like future andrew's problem so i shut my laptop and walked away <laughs> of course so we come to realize <laughs> bundle does not clean up zombie processes and processes as an init system do what system d in it what is it in it that the uh it was bundle doesn't clean these up. It's just a Ruby process. It just runs the web server. It runs it and it just says, I'm happy, whatever. I'll leave all these other processes to do whatever they want. It didn't clean them up. So what we had to do, we had to go into our, it was a nice fix. It was actually a quick fix. Uh, in the Docker compose file, we just said, there's a, a neat little, uh, in it parameter. flat. I don't know if you want to call it a flat. Yeah. Parameter basically saying, uh, do you want to, it's an init parameter. I don't know if that just means it includes bash in there or includes an init system in the container. It does. What that looks uh, like. So there's an init system called tiny, T-I-N-I. And that is the init system that calls the command. I don't know if it calls the entry point as well, uh, but that is the, the init process that is run. And long story short, that... That started cleaning up all of our zombie processes, and next thing we know, we are up and running. The yeah. zombie processes. Yeah, so it took us uh, two hops, but you know, we got there eventually. We I was gonna say, I was gonna say, we uh, made you, it. You you did have a nice write up here about that too. So we we do have that on our new compositional enterprises blog. Uh, so that is under there. Um, I also tried to sh- split up the show notes into instance features, service resiliency, engagement, and administrative. Uh, Jack, you're probably going to recognize this. Um, Everyone at home may not. Uh, This is how we split up our Q4 goals. So uh, this is kind of keeping us accountable as to, you know, of our overall kind of pillars or what you want to call them uh, for Q4, how are, what, what are the developments lead, leading towards? Like, where where do we classify right. them? What are, what are we spending our time on? So, um, part of the service that would that all being under the instance features category, uh, what we've done in the service resiliency category is uh, split up our projects into stable three and stable four. I touched on that earlier. Um, CSCD had to be fixed uh, because we're no longer building off of straight master. There's a lot more logic that had to go into those those scripts. Um, we were able to pull up new playbooks that enabled no impact restart of services, or at least no impact to Minimal. any other services. Yeah. yeah. When we're doing um, a restart of a service, it doesn't bring the whole instance down. It only blips that one service, and then we're back up and running. Uh, and then lastly, which is a huge thing unto, unto, which is a huge thing unto itself is the secure remote callback support. That is something that I had experimented with. Taking a look at the blog post, it was like five years ago. Uh, you know, and, and it's like, how do you use a 
publicly accessible jump host to troubleshoot someone else's computer no matter where they are right and the steps to do that um you know there there's plenty of ways to do that now um, you can use um, WireGuard VPNs, you know, you can use other tunneling type systems. Uh, I just chose to use good old SSH because it's it's very simple and straightforward. Um, the, the, there was there were some kind of cool ways that we used uh, key generation and different di <laughs> just different bashisms the way the way we were getting around uh, limitations in in how we want to keep things secret but also provide access really to, to anyone who who needs it um, what what we're hoping for in the the future is you know if if someone's maybe not on our infrastructure but needs some support right could that be something uh, that we would be able to provide them in a secure type manner. And I believe this would be something uh, that would implement that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's an exciting one. I, I'm i going to have to look. I, I saw your post from a while back. I didn't know. I don't know if you're using, is it a, is it a, are you using a service or do you just expose SSH? Do you just open it up? So, so there's, and I'm not going to go into this today because we're, we're running short on time, but there is a service that I've added. So like right next to accounting or portal, uh, there's another service that I just entitled callback uh, that exposes itself publicly. Uh, I believe it was on port 9022. Uh, and then it has a user in it, um, customizable username that gets started in a restricted shell and it can only run various custom scripts that are pre-approved that are in that image. And it's, it's odd because this is the exact same paradigm that we've used for commands receivable, wherein we are whitelisting commands, the commands that yeah. can be ran and it seems like this type of paradigm continues to reinforce itself as a very scalable type solution uh, to to problems like these, uh, where we don't necessarily want to expose anything but a limited amount of processes.